Well, here we are at the Tang de Pierre, an absolutely stunning French fishery with some awesome creatures in it that go to over 70 pounds. We're here with some of the Ultima team. They're from all across Europe and they've fished some of the most demanding conditions carp anglers could be faced with. The lake hasn't been fishing brilliantly and the weather doesn't look like it's going to be on our side. However, if anyone can do it, these guys can. Should be an interesting few days. We've been developing a team of consultants um, in, in the carp field in the last two to three years. Um, we started off with three or four in the UK and, and now we've got consultants from all over Europe. As a line company and, and the, the specialist line company, it's been really important for us to uh, listen to these guys as we've moved more into the carp market. You know, their input's been invaluable uh, in developing product. What it's leading on to is a whole host of other products that, that, as a result of their input, are going to be launched into the market both in the UK and Europe in the next three, four years. Coming down here was, um, you know, really a, a sort of a, a new step for us because we've got this great group of guys, um, some really good, good anglers, some good thinking anglers, and this is something we like to do now, uh, bring these guys together. And the idea for the DVD came as a result of that, that we thought we'd take it on another step because of so many good guys here who know their subject. The reason we chose this lake, uh, Tang de Pierre, is, is because not only has, has it got a great reputation, is that it's in a perfect central position for us because we've got anglers coming from Spain, uh, France, Benelux and UK, of course. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good location here. Right, so let's find out a bit more about the Ultima team. Who exactly are they and what style of carp fishing do they enjoy? Yeah, the kind of carp fishing I really enjoy is the, um, it's the technical side. Uh, obviously, I love being outdoors and whatever, and what carp fishing brings to you, but it's the technical side that I really, really sort of embrace. I love to hunt for the big fish and uh, I like uh, to fish for the rivers, the big rivers and the big lakes. These are my favourites. I like hard waters, basically, waters with big fish in uh, that are a bit of a challenge. Well, nowadays, I do prefer to target the bigger fish. Well, what basically means I fish the lakes that contain a PB. Uh, I like fishing in uh, not crowded waters in Holland and the big lakes in, uh, in France. The type of carp fishing I enjoy most, it's difficult to say. I just really love being out there carp fishing. I'm not... I, I don't now just go and hunt big fish, I just love going carp fishing. Uh, the type of carp fishing I enjoy at the moment is targeting the bigger end of the scale. Um, but carp fishing in general, is, there's just no buzz like it. The carp fishing I enjoy most now is the pioneering and the thought of the previously uncaught monster fish. I've fished some big lakes in excess of 100,000 acres and there's always that possibility that you know, you're going to get your, your, your string pulled by something really special. And my favourite type of carp fishing is big open lakes, so you never know what to expect when you're getting a run. It's always a surprise when you catch something, so that's nice. The type of carp fishing I like the most is uh, stalking and waiting behind my rods on uh, target fishing on the big fish. The type of carp fishing I like is uh, doing the fishing without the boat, without the use of any boat, bait boat or whatever, like a bit of stalking, yeah, fishing in the margins, that kind of uh, fishing I really like to do.
Nice one. Looking after your line is very important. There's a lot of factors to bear in mind. Pete knows a hell of a lot about line. What are the main things we should be thinking about, Pete? Well, I, you're exactly right what you say, Joe. A lot of people do just buy their line, put it on the reels, fish with it, and don't think about it. And you can get a lot more out of your line, and that could land you that extra big fish on that one occasion when your line would have let you down if you hadn't looked after it. You want to keep your line in a fairly cool, dark place. You know, so when you get home from your fishing, you don't want to just leave your rods lent outside against the shed in direct sunlight. That's the same as when you've been fishing. There's always going to be some deterioration over a long period of time. That's why our line don't last forever. We change it on a fairly regular basis. So that's the first point, is to sort of keep it dark, keep it cool. Last winding of the day, damp cloth in your hand, round the, the butt, bring the line through. It gives it a clean. Another thing I do, I don't know about yourself, but... Most sessions, or certainly every sort of month or so, I, don't know, I wouldn't say every session, I strip like a couple of rod lengths off and just feel through those couple of rod lengths because if any part's going to get damaged, it's those, that last section, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we all fish at some period of time to a feature, and whether that be a bar or mussels or snags or whatever it may be, and even things in open water that you don't think are there can be laying on the bottom that will damage your line, you know, things you, you haven't fished, haven't searched for. So that's a very important thing, you know... A lot of people will lose a fish and, oh, I got cut. Well, did they? Was that a nick from the session before and it's just gone and they don't think, they thought, oh, it must be a muscle bed or something. It probably wasn't. It was just that line just had got nick. damaged, little nick. So, brilliant advice, that. Strip five, ten metres off, cut it off, give it a wipe. Yeah, feel it through your fingers. That's good to go. Another rig on. And what about actually loading your reels? Easy rule to follow. Put your spooler line... Cold water, lake water's fine. Drop it in, label up. When you then load your reels, all modern, most modern reels all go the same way. That will then peel off and go on to the reel the right way. Another little tip, once you've loaded your line on, lean your rod up against a tree, walk it down the bank, sort of 100 metres. If you can tie it off to another tree, give it a little bit of a stretch. This gives that line that little bit, takes the elasticity out of it from, from where it's been sitting on the spool. If then you then wind it back through a damp cloth onto your spool, you'll take all the twist out of it completely. The modern rigs that we yeah. use naturally put twist into the line. So, I, you know, as many swivels or whatever that you do. I think some years ago, when I was a kid, I don't remember having twist in my line. I think it's because we always used a running lead and, and, a, and a swivel, and that was it. But now we've got tubing and leaders and, uh, yeah, and, and everything, yeah. So I, I think... I would say every two or three times you went fishing, if you had that time to just run those three rods down the bank and wind them back in with nothing on the end, you would really notice that in a performance side of your line. Thirty-seven, thirteen. The main thing to get across is that your line is a vital, vital part of your kit. And without it being in tip-top condition, you could actually lose that fish that it's taken you years to catch. So just take care of it. What it's about is getting the best out of your line while you're using it, because it might just catch you that fish that you've always wanted to catch. So how do people know when to change their line then? I think it's, it's down to how much you fish. If you're out there three, four days a week, I think you need to be looking at changing your line every three months, really. When you're checking your line, if you're doing that on a fairly regular basis, you're cutting off five or ten metres. You know, purely because oh, I've had three fish on that, so I'm just going to strip that back a little bit and trim it off. You're going to be losing line off your spool anyhow. So once you, once you start getting down below the lip, you're going to limit your casting distance and, and the performance of your reels as well. So as a general rule of thumb, if you fish a lot, sort of every three months. If you fish once, twice a week, then I reckon every five to six months. Right, cool. And you sort of just touched on that there, but when you're filling a reel up, um, it's important to fill it up to the lip of the, the spool, really, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot, a lot of people will just slightly overfill just to cover, you know, going up and down the rod, really. If you're fishing at long range as well, slightly overfilling, that's never going to give you a problem because it's always out. Bring them up flush, look after it, and it'll last you a long time catch you a lot of fish.
Oh, Steve, we're both massive lovers of fluorocarbon, aren't we? Oh, definitely so. Um, I have been since, well, since the invention of fluorocarbon, probably, what, eight, nine years ago. And it's come a long way since then as well, hasn't it? Massively, massively. It was very, very stiff material. Um, it's an ideal, it's got a light refractive properties, 96% in water. It, so once that's on the bottom, it's totally invisible. But this stuff takes it to a different level. Um, over the years, they've got softer and softer, and people have claimed that they're, you know, their ideal is acting like a braid, but they don't. They don't. But this, this one, since I've got my hands on this, if you can see how supple that is, once you, once you pull your hand along, that is so supple. It's almost like a braid. Um, it's certainly something that, you know, I probably fish fluorocarbon 80% of my fishing. Um, this is going to be the one that I'm going to be using an awful lot. I like the once I've cast in, I like to put a, a, a stringer or a round bag on that curls the hook link round. You know, I'm feathering it down so it drops quite near the lead, so there's an element of travel. So that there's a bit of movement there. If the fish comes in and sucks it, there is the movement there for it to go in its mouth. Yeah, well, as opposed to it. Just... Well, primarily being a big fish angler, that's what I, that's what I target in fish 25 plus. They can they can suck from a distance, and I've, I've seen them do it. Um, so I always want an element of travel. I don't want I don't want to rely on a, a fish coming in, moving onto the hook bait and picking it up itself. If it, if it sucks at it, it doesn't deem it as a you know a dangerous rig, and it's not going to get picked up. This stuff will offer that. It's the nearest thing to a braid, but in a fluorocarbon which is invisible. I don't I don't think you can beat it. I don't no, think you're going to better it. It comes in 12, 15, and 18 pound. This is the 15, and this is. Well, it's one of the most supplest 15 pound, even of a line, you know. Definitely, mate. Like. Yeah, I've never seen a fluorocarbon that stuff. I, I'd always recommend having a, t a, a spool of this in your uh, in your tackle box. I've got to say, like, I, for the last year or so, I've been using a lot of combi rigs with a section of fluorocarbon and a section of supple braid just yep. to give that hook that bit of movement. Yep. But with this, I don't think I'd even need that little section of supple braid. No, you know? it's, no it's so it's a, it's a it's a new one to me. But I've been using it over the last three days that we've we've been filming. I've been using it and. Uh, it hasn't tangled, it's just acted lovely. I've cast it in the edges, put it in the edges, and it just does exactly what it's supposed to do as, as, a, as a hook link. So, no, it's a definite, it's a definite one for me. I'll, I'll be having spools of that in my tackle box, Joe. Me too. <laughs> Right, we've come around with Pete and he's going to show us something a little bit special, I'm not sure what. So uh, we're looking at the power stiff, aren't we? Yeah, this purpose-built line that we de developed for stiff rigs uh, and choddies is quite unique. Um, one of the main factors on the design of the product was its diameter. A lot of stiff rig material is so thick that you, have, you end up using very big hooks, to, and, it, and that's a downside if you want to go because you, can't, times, get you can't get back through the eye for D's or whatever. So we do two sizes, tw 18 and 22, and the diameter is sort of spot on. You can get three times through the, the eye of a size 10. So for little choddies and that, it's, it's spot on. But you know when you've, you've caught fish and you've you sort of got it in and you looked at your hook length or whatever and you're like, oh, God, I'll tie another one or whatever, something a little bit special about this line cut a bit off here. It's got a couple of loops in the end. I'll explain that in a minute. Make as big a mess of that as you possibly can and I'll show you something. Really? Yeah, go cool. on. Alright. We don't tighten a knot, but <laughs> anything other. <laughs> yeah, alright. I mean... <laughs> I mean, that's pretty bad, that's, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's the end of that, really. But... There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. You'd never I, use that, would you? you, you would, no, you would just cut that off and, and uh, I mean, that is completely ruined. But the unique thing about, I mean, if, if your rig was that, if it was like that, then you'd, you'd give up, wouldn't you? Straight in the bin. Yeah, straight in the bin. But this product is totally unique. And I bet you've not seen many lines <laughs> that have it's done incredible, that. It's incredible, isn't it? There's not one tiny little kink or anything in it, is there? It's, it's just a remarkable product. It's just... Bulletproof. It is. It is, gives you so much confidence. 
I'm not saying that when you've got a rig in that you would then straighten it and maybe use that again and again and again, but you know during the process of catching a fish that that's not going to let you down. It just shows you how robust it really is, doesn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. So when you've tied your rig, you can either give it a pull or, or even give it a little steam. I don't suppose you need a steam. It, you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can pull it and, and get it in exactly the shape. Obviously, if you want to make a bit more advanced rigs without tubing and have the curve and whatever, then, yeah, you would need to steam it. But as it is, straight off the spool... It's, it's every stiff rig that you ever wanted to make, really. Very impressive. Well, here we are at the bait table. We're going to have a look at a few interesting products from Richworth. First of all... New bait, is it, Steve? It's a very unique bait, very unique. Um, it's got a lot of powders in there, and it's designed to, to catch big carp. It's got enough aminos, enough proteins. The big carp will actually realise that this is a good bait from straight away, and it's proved it. Just taking it out on the field testing, on, on, on the article, the features I do, the live features, um, I've had six different 30s and a mid-40 um, on live fishing at a weekend. Um, we've given it to Bob Baker... Ronnie Bass, Ian Paul, they've all gone out and they've all caught 30s on it straight away. Um, and, and that's what it's designed to do. Once the general public get hold of this bait, it's out in January. All the sizes that Richworth normally do, the 10 mil, the 14 mil, the 18 mil, and for Europe, they'll make a 20 mil. Pellets will be available, the same, same recipe, but rolled into, you know, into however they do it. I don't know how they do it, but into a pellet. Uh, pellet form, so you know that, that you've got every angle covered. For if you're putting pellets in your spod mix, or you want to heat the pellets up with warm water and put it in as a mush into your spod mix, um, and you can fish it, you know, straight straight over the boilies. Yes, it's pretty unique, um, and it will catch a lot of fish. A lot of fish. We've taken it round round the country now, um, and it's produced lots of thirties. We, we fished it on a catfish lake that only had eight eight carp in it. Bob gave uh, this guy eight boilies because he was running out of bait. And, uh, mate, he had three of, the, three of the carp. They never get caught the carp in there. He had three of the carp in a night. Um, so, as well as being a, it is an instant bait, but also they get a taste for it and they realise oh, yeah. the goodness of it. So it's, got, it's got a very special powder in there, which I'm definitely not going to diverse into. Maybe later when the cameras are. I might do, but it's got a very special powder that I know is some. Um, I know that it is an instant carp attractor, and it's a big carp attractor, um, and it will go. This bait will. It's based on a base mix that. It's the low fat ultra mix. Basically, this will go all the all the way through the year. You can use this bait all year, and you will catch in the winter on it as well. Even though it's got an element of fish meal, but it's got very low oil content. Sounds superb. Yeah, get on it. <laughs> Look what jumped out of the bowl. A one litre bowl. Yeah. Right, we're here with Coast now. Come to have a look at the power carp. So, mate, how long have you been using this in? I've been using this for about two years now. I've got on it by a mate of mine, and it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's got a fluorocarbon coating, which makes it, like, 100% waterproof. The waterproofing part is very important because it keeps the knot strength 100%. Right. Uh, the, bra uh, the abrasion resistance is awesome. It's a very, very tough line. But one of the most important features I find is that it's got a very low initial stretch, which gives you the advantage that you get really, really good uh, line of bite detection and the first contact with the fish yeah, is, is there, like, like with braid nearly, really. I've heard some friends that I know use it, you know, they swore by braid for years, yeah. and now they're using this because they find it's well, more beneficial to what they're doing. Yeah, and, and the good part with it is, like with braid, you get the initial detection, yeah, but after that you don't have to stretch. 
With this, you get the initial uh, the initial detection, the initial good contact, but after that, it is forgiving. So it, it gives you a bit of stretch, and the hook doesn't pull really fast. That is one horrible thing about braid, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's worst feeling. <laughs> and I suppose also, with the fluorocarbon coating, does that help it to sink? Yeah, it makes it makes the line a lot heavier, which, and I like to fish select lines like most people now these days, because these fish are so wary, and yeah, I, it's really heavy, so it's really, really good, yeah. Another great thing about it, with the fluorocarbon, it makes it virtually invisible, and with the clear well, sand pits or gravel pits, it, that is a big, big advantage. Well, it's a common fact that uh, fluorocarbon has the same light refractions as water. So is that the same with the coating? Yeah, I mean, it definitely reduces the visibility of, like, of, the, the, of the line. I mean, it ain't a 100% fluorocarbon line, but it's got the qualities of nylon, yeah, and the benefits of fluorocarbon. Makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. Get on it. Feels good. But all the fish, all the fish here feels heavy. So I cannot say if it's a big one or not, but Hello, my name is Shope, this is Stephen, and we want to tell you something about carp care. We think it's a very important uh, part of uh, carp fishing, and carp care is not starting uh, at the bank, it's starting at home, and we want to show you some things we use uh, in caring uh, for the carp. Yeah, it's very important to use the correct material, the right line, uh, obviously the right hook links, the right rigs for the situation that you're fishing in. Obviously, if you're fishing into snags and, and um, difficult situations, you want to be able to eject the lead so you've got a direct line to your fish. That way, that if you end up losing the fish, um, that it's not going to end up tethered in any way. When you catch a fish, it's very important that you use a very good moth. This is a very big one. I like it very much because it's big. The fish can, can lay, in, lay in it entirely, can get out. You can put this one over it so it can get out when you uh, have to do something else. And you can take it back into the water. We'll show you later on that you could, uh, put the fish in the moth and you put it in the water so it doesn't have to be on the bank very long. It's a very nice moth, I think. It's got a variety of uses. Uh, it's inflatable, which is important for the bigger fish because they've got padding, they've got cushioning, and it, it also gives you confidence. If you haven't got everything prepared, like your waistling and your scales, and it's still in your kit, you can cover the fish so if it does go sort of a bit flappy on you then um, it's not going to jump out the, the wasteling or, or, or the mat and onto the gravel. Right, there's uh, quite a few things you need to be aware of when sacking fish. The first one is that the fish is in the correct depth of water because if it's hot and sunny there's not going to be a lot of oxygen in the margins. Typically you're going to sack fish overnight unless you're just going to pop them in the bag whilst you get your bits and bobs, your camera, your waistling, scales and etc. sorted. Um, I've got a nice fish here on for, uh, for, the, for the camera that we've sacked. Um, obviously, they're going to recharge their batteries if they've been in the water for any length of time, so try and keep your sack time to a minimum. And what we've done is we've sacked this in a good depth of water, so, you know, obviously to reduce the stress. So when you're going to bring your fish out of the water, you need to evenly distribute the weight. You don't just want to snatch it out the, the water in the sack. You've got to be careful that its fins are all, all um, tucked away nicely because you don't want to be bending or breaking or dislocating parts of the fish. And we want to try and keep the fish as low to the ground as possible. Don't want to be standing up with it. There we go. OK. As 
So we've secured this fish, typically with a, a, a zip sack. In years gone by, they used to be Hessian sacks. But how carp fishing's developed, we actually tie a few knots in the sack so the fish does not um, break free in any way. Obviously, when we retain the fish on its pole, it needs to be secure. The last thing we want is a fish going off in the bag and us coming down to where we've tied it off to, um, to, to no real success, to see it's, you know, where it's escaped. Very important for um, the healing process of the, the fish's mouth. Use something like um, Clinic from Christ on, which is great, but it's very important that this fish heals from its hook hold. They come with um, cotton wool pads, which is an ideal application or applicator for popping this um, solution, antiseptic solution. They may not like it. It gives a sting in the beginning, I guess. Yeah, it's just like, um, like our cuts and grazes. Right, before we pop this fish in the wasteling, we're going to pop a little bit of water over her just to keep her nice and wet. Typically on a hot sunny day, you need to keep them um, moist because obviously they live in the water. You don't want any part of them drying out. And with a minimum of fuss, we're just going to slide her over. And we want her sat in the wasteling like this. We don't want the fish upside down. We don't want it on its side as well because um, obviously it can damage its pecs. Maybe you've noticed that we d don't wear any watches or rings or things like that. There's no rings involved. And these wastelings are absolutely great because they've got a zip either side and um, you know there you have it, you've got the fish nice and safe ready to be weighed. Now in order to get a correct reading on the, um, on the, on the weight we've got a weigh bar it just stops if it's a real big personal best, it stops any shape, gives you a nice accurate reading. Gonna come up away from the mat, and there we go. Nice fish for around 15 kilos, what a cracker. It's important to grip its front peck fin and the anal fin. That way you, you, you can almost feel the tension in the fish if it's gonna uh, flex and, and, and play up. You see, it's quite easy. I think it's long enough. This fish has been long enough out of the water, so we put it back now. We had time to make some good pictures if we wanted to. Could you please uh, get the, the waist leg out? Just put it out entirely. Yes. Now, you can either put it back in the waist sling into the water, but we're just going to demonstrate how good this waist sling, uh, this unhooking mat actually is because you can use it as a raft and float your fish out into the water for your trophy water shots. This mat's got four handles either side, so it's easy for carrying. Now, we've had this fish out of the water now for about five minutes, which, in all honesty, is about long enough. It's long enough to have had um, its photograph taken, its weight recorded, so we're now going to pop this mat back. You'll notice that Shub's in the water it's um, when you're fishing with steep banks it's it's always best to get in there with your fish so we're in the water now nothing can happen to the fish anymore i will take it out put it gently in the water and then hold it for some moments see if it can swim on its own yeah you need always need to keep contact with your fish now especially if it's had a good hard fight you don't really want to be pointing it out into the lake you want the head into the bank so if it doesn't revive it's not too far out of uh, grasp reach. And you see, it's gone. Well done, mate. Well, well done. looked after. So I've got the old Euro boilies here now, mate. Yep. So obviously it's, it's a range of boilies that are... Um, they are much cheaper than the, the, the baits they produce in England. They're produced for the European market. They sell very, very well. It's, they mass produce them so they can make them more efficiently. So they roll them up um, with exactly the same flavours that you can buy. All the flavours that are synonymous in, in England, uh, they use them in the, um, in the Euro range. You've got your pineapples, your crab and mussel. That's a very popular one in, in, 
Europe. It's caught a hell of a lot of fish. That a one, lot of fish. Yeah. I mean, the tootie. You know, it's all the same, all the same ingredients, flavour-wise, but the base mix is just, you know, it, it, it's it's not cut or anything. It's a different base mix, but they catch an awful lot of fish. Um, they also do the pellets to go with them, but the pellets are the same pellets that you're going to buy in England. Um, so you, you, you've got the, the crossover of the popular of the popular ones, two easy crabs, crabs, your KG ones. They do the pellet for it, um, and they do the range of pop-ups to go with it. You know, they've just caught an awful lot of big continental fish, mainly in the 20 mil variety, because that's what the Europeans seem to like. You know, and they're fishing these crayfish infested waters and and. And the uh, little catfish, what they called? Um, that's on shit. You know, because they whittle them down quite quick, so that's why they've designed them specifically for the European market. Um, absolutely blinding. I'd say there's, there's not a lot of difference. If you're fishing, you know, pressured water, six fish in it, probably not the sort of type of bait you would you would want to use, but if you're fishing these big continental waters, they're travelling, they're travelling, uh, you know, sort of... 20, uh, 20 acres to get to some uh, to get to some of the, ne- the next available bit of bait. Massive waters. They come across this. They're going to eat them, um, and and they do the job exactly what they're supposed to do. Catch big carp. Joe, something a little bit special here. This is new. It's unique and it's ultimate pure power, pure fluorocarbon mainline. But it's been dyed and softened so that it casts better and is less visible to the angler, that is, than the previous fluorocarbons. That makes good sense to me. It's one thing, I mean, I do use fluorocarbon mainlines, right. and if I've got a cast, you know, 100 yards or so, oh, I'll get so stressed out. <laughs> well, I've actually cast this uh, about 110. Really? Yeah, yeah, on 15 pound line. This is about 0.35. Um, breaks breaks at 18 pounds. Got brilliant abrasion resistance. It's been through this unique softening process, and we've dyed it green because a lot of guys don't like white lines. I don't know why. Like I know you're like me. You don't really worry as long as it does the job. We're producing this softened fluorocarbon in both white and and this sort of green colour. Excellent. I suppose. A lot of people that use for a carbon use it because it sinks so well, that's, don't they? That's the main reason. And no. so generally, if you're using it, you're using it with a slack or a semi-slack line, so yep. it's going to be along the bottom that's anyway, right. isn't it? That's right, that's right. And I mean, conventionally, fluorocarbons were originally used for their invisibility because their light refractive index is about the same as water. Uh, but then more recently, like you and a lot of other guys have wanted a line that sinks quickly and will lay along the bottom. Hence the demand for a fluorocarbon main line. Um, we're you know, conscious of, of what's going on in the trade and therefore we've tried to s- supply the best product in that category. Excellent. Another thing I've found with fluorocarbon is it's a very dense line and because yeah. it's so dense it tends to be quite abrasive resistance. Yeah, it's abrasive resistance. Um, it's not strength sometimes is questionable but we've tested this and the knot strength is about 15 pounds, about the breaking strain, and the linear uh, strength is 18 pounds. So it... it it, can't fold it, that no, anything. no, it ticks all the boxes. It will be available soon. As you can see, all I've got here is, uh, is, is production samples, but it will be on the market before too long. Excellent. I'll keep an eye out for that. Good man. He's got 36 and a quarter. Yeah. Seems about right to me. 36 and a quarter pounds of Pierre Common Carp. OK. OK, a rig I'd like to uh, demonstrate on how to tie. It's a rig that I've used for probably the last eight years, maybe seven, since the advent of uh, fluorocarbon. I'm going to be doing it with the power link, which is made in-house by Ultima. Um, they've softened it. It's the next level on. It's ideal for a hook link. I like the bait to, to curl around, have a little element of travel, and to do it with fluorocarbon is fantastic, and this product offers you that facility. Uh, I'll show you what I normally do. I normally take off about 14 inches because we're doing turns around the hook. The hook link gets shorter and shorter. We're going to tie a simple overhand knot. That is just literally to secure the boilie in place. 
as you can see, just from that, that is a simple overhand loop. And we're going to cut off the tag end and secure the boilie on. So we're just going to put the boilie through, secure it with a boilie stop. The only hook I use now with any type of fluorocarbon is, is the stiff riggers, the ESP stiff riggers. Um, Core to do the choddy, you know, anything with an outturned eye. But on this particular rig, because of the, the, the way the eye is angled for the, for the chod rigs, try and straighten it back a bit. It's still got a slightly outturned eye, but too much and the hook doesn't sit. You'll see it, it, this is all about the way the hook sits aggressively towards the, you know, in conjunction with the boilie. So the first thing you do, is take the, uh, the, the power link, poke it through the back of the eye, and then slide the hook down into position. And what I normally do is just, I just push it down so it just passes the top of the boilie. And that's quite critical. You don't want it too close because there's no travel on the hair. The hair still, because this material is quite soft, the hair actually, I, I love the way the hair separates once the carp takes it in. So what we're doing is doing three turns around the top of the hook and then just by that I'm letting the boilie go and then I'm taking the rest of the turns around the other side of the hair and then I normally do about six turns and then back through this is quite critical not back through that through the you know the face of the eye but through the back of the eye again and then that is literally the rig done and as I said you know it's the type of rig if you turn up you haven't got a rig tied I've called it you know, years and years ago, I called it the basic complicated rig because it is very, very basic to make, but it's complicated in the way that the way that the hook sits. And once we've done that, we bend the eye out, and if you can see how aggressively that hook sits, I've caught over a hundred English thirties on this rig, this rig alone. Um, you know, so I know it works for big fish. I've caught a lot of other fish on it, but it's it's a big fish rig. It can't get any simpler than that. But just the way that, that the hook sits. It, will, it literally takes hold normally in the scissors. That's where you'll get your hook hold. Um, like I say, you know, a softer material, you can design a rig to, to hook straight bang in the centre of the bottom lip, but this isn't what it's about. OK, yeah, I'll say a little trick you can do. Um, because you've tied this, you've gone fishing, you've tied this basically when you've arrived, you can either thread, this, um, thread the bag with the pellets. If you're fishing in silk weed, or, you know, sort of detritus bottom. You can literally thread on a little bag, pull the hook through. I would normally use um, the PVA that's a little bit more... Uh, this one is not perfect, but you can pull the hook through and you've got a... Um, literally, your hook is covered by the PVA bag, so you can cast that onto silk weed, any kind of, you know, sort of mucky area, really, that you don't want to cast a single hook bait out onto. Uh, and the fluorocarbon, it's perfect. It sinks to all the contours. You can see how, how supple that is. It will sink to any contours uh, and disappear, literally, during the daytime, and it definitely upped my catch rate. Well, one of my favourite methods, is, and this is probably the one that's caught me more big fish than any other method to put on to the basic complicated rig, is literally, it's quite simple, a stringer of five boilies. If I was using a double, double boilie, I'd use seven, seven baits. But this, this is how it works. I've called this one, like, the round stringer, and I used it back in the 80s um, when I was using these massive boilies and I didn't know whether to put any spares out um, so I was putting small baits around the big one. Literally what we're doing, you take your hook bait, you're tying on your stringer straight onto the bottom of the hook. I normally secure it twice because, you know, PVA string can slip. You don't want that. Um, so, and what we're doing now is we're just going to slide the knot up to the top of where we've knotted we've knotted the, uh, the, the fluorocarbon. And literally, just take the bottom end, because I've put the boilie on halfway through, it's got a little loop that we can loop the boilie onto. And we loop it through. OK, so we've got a little round stringer. And then what we do is we push the boilie through the other side. So it's exactly dead centre of all the baits. Trim off the tag end. And that's the bit we're going to use to secure the hair down. This is just taking it a little level further. You don't want to cast that and that ends up over the top of that. You know, you, you've, got a, you've got a very poor presentation. So I always tie down with the, the tag end of the quick melt, so you're not using a massive amount of it, onto the shank of the hook. Literally, it's easier when it's on your rod. It's, uh, it's a bit more difficult to show now, but just, just one loop, just to hold it in place while you're casting it. You can cast this into silkweed, 
into weed, anywhere you want, flat bottom, and that will help you, it helps anti-tangle, and what it does is I always feather the rod down. Wherever I cast, I feather the rod down, no matter what, you know, what bottom it is, I feather it down so that so the rig is always going down and dropping. And where it's, you know, this is going to be about 10 inches long, it's generally going to curve, and I've done it in the edges and I've seen it work, and it generally curves, and it gives that, that rig a little element of travel. The movement of big fish is totally different than a small fish that's, you know, not upright in itself, moving along very quickly. Once that's in the water and the PVA is dissolved, it's very difficult to make out which one's a hook bait. So if it's difficult for a human to analyse in that process, it's going to be a hell of a difference for a carp. He's not going to... He's, generally, they just come in, snuffle the whole lot, find out he's hooked. You've got your aggressive hook, and that has caught me over 100 English 30s, and that, that proves that that rig is a very big fish rig. Um, it's probably all I've got to say on it. You know, it's a very, very good rig. Using it in the conjunction with the, the power link, it, it, it'll catch you a lot of fish. 34, 9. Right, moving on with, uh, with carp rigs and technology, uh, and the forethought that's gone into this particular rig, I've called this, I've come up with this rig probably, I don't know, probably 12 years ago, something like that. Um, and this particular rig is called the Fish Fighter. Um, it's a Fishmaster Fighter. Um, it's a Fishmaster Fighter. It's a Fishmaster Fighter. I'd say six years ago, um, after watching, you know, watching a lot of uh, carp in the edges, how they get rid of rigs, I've called this one the Hermit Lead. It's a very, very clever rig, uh, and it's the ultimate. I, I can't think of anything better than this particular rig. Now, it's using the Power Shock Leader, which is going to be, uh, it's got a permanent home in my tackle box, this, this product, and you need this for the Hermit rig. I would normally have about five turns of this, so you're using an awful lot of it, um, five turns on the reel, so there's probably about 40 foot. Um, but this is a shock leader with a difference because this is fluorocarbon, it will sink down. You, you, you use this particular rig, because it's elasticated, and I'll show you in a minute how we're elasticating it, but primarily what you've got to get into your head is that this goes straight through to the swivel, protected by the bead, which is quite important. I'll use the first contact beads, but you need a, a tough rubber bead, not the hard plastic, but a tough rubber bead. Um, because if you have a soft bead, once you cast out, the swivel can end up back through, back through inside the bead, which affects the mechanics. But if you look at this, I'll put this on my hand just to demonstrate it. You've only got to move a few mil, and that's literally taking hold of my finger, and it starts to hurt after a while, because it's pulling, the, the elasticity is pulling against it's, it's almost gravity, but it's not gravity. But it's all inside the lead, and hence why I called it the, the, uh, the hermit rig. But it, it will catch fish right the way through the winter. This is when I really use it. But like I say, the power shock leader is probably one of the, the key elements. Um, and also the tail rubber. What we've got inside here, the little tag end, and I'll demonstrate this in a minute. If I pull this rig, you'll see through there that the, the uh, pole elastic is whipped on. And if you notice how far back it is, it's probably about just, just under three quarters of the way up the tubing. So there's very little amount of pole elastic to do that job. And what happens, once the fish is hooked, if you get a really clever fish that tries to pick that up, that picks up the, 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 the lead on its axis. So it will always get the weight of the lead, whatever way it's moving. If, it moving, if it's moving sideways, and once he's had enough, the fish has decided he's not going to get rid of this particular rig, he's going to bolt, that pulls out of the tail rubber. So you're left with a little tag end. The fish is you're literally then onto a running rig. And basically, you can fish your bobbins on the floor. You need, it's very critical, don't fish this tight to the lead because the elastic won't be able to stretch then. So that's the rig null and void. You need to let the, the, the power shock leader do its job, lay along the bottom, have the bobbin on the floor. Once that's run, you, you'll get a little tiny flicker on the bobbin, then it whack, you're gone, you're into a running rig. So, but the key element to this is the pole elastic and the shock leader, which, you know, it lays down flat. Everything's out the way. You haven't got to worry about back leads. You don't want back leads on this. This is the whole point. You want your bobbins on the floor, nice slack, so you're not going to spook the fish. There's one mouthful to go at. You can still fish this over a, a, a bed of particle or boilie, um, and it will nail a lot of fish. And what I've incorporated, basically on, on the rig end, just a very open gaped rig with a tiny little kicker, little piece of tubing. I've been using the, uh, the, the fang twisters on this particular rig because they do turn in very, very, very quick. They're, they're 
ultra sharp. All you need is just li literally the fish to move a millimetre of pressure away from the lead and it will do its job. So what we've, um, I'm incorporating here is a new prototype braid from Ultima. This has got the sinking element, it will lay flat. You can see how nicely it's cooled round. They've put in a fleck to break it up. Most bottoms, whatever you're fishing over, will have elements of black in it. It will do the job. Um, this one will be out in the new year. It's certainly uh, another product for my tackle box. So I'm going to put this rig on and we're going to show you how we catch a carp on it. The, the key part to this and the, the bit that I get asked the most is the pole elastic and where it goes. Now you're literally going to do a four turn grinner knot and holding a very small tag end at the bottom. It's just literally a, a slip knot like you put on um, pole elastic on, you know, if you're marking your line up or whatever. Just literally four turns and then we're going to pull it nice and tight. It's a little bit difficult to work with pole elastic but it will go into a knot. And then what we're going to do is slide it down. This is the hardest part that people don't understand so I'm going to go slower on this part. We're tagging off the bottom, we're chopping off the tag end off the bottom. And if we can find the tail rubber, we're going to pull this through till we can just see it at the other end. And then trap the tail rubber on as not to pull that part back through. So what we need, we need the knot about here, three quarters of the way up the tubing. If you have it too close down here, when you pull it, the knot comes out and it can loop the leader. So you don't want that, the rig, once that happens, the rig won't work. So you need it literally further up here. So I'm going to slide this down, get hold of the, uh, the, the, the power shock leader, slide it down, work it out finger-wise, that's perfect. And now we're just going to tighten that up really tight so it doesn't slip. Trim off the little tiny tag in almost to, you know, so it's so close so it doesn't get caught up in the tubing system and then pull it up. You can now take the tail rubber off and adjust your tension. So if we test the tension there, we can see it's working perfectly. Absolutely perfect. But you can see just, how, I'm sorry if that's a bit quick, but that's how fast a carp can shake its head and, and he's gone on a normal rig. You know, you can throw your lead and that's the idea of this particular rig. So we'll just put down the, uh, the we'll put down the, the tail rubber, on it goes, chop off the tag end, and you have yourself probably what I'd consider, I've been into rigs for like nearly 30 years of carp angling, I've been in, this has been the side that I've always been into. It, it's probably what I'd consider the ultimate carp rig. Well, good morning. Uh, made a bit of a prediction when I was making the rigs yesterday. I'd catch one on the hermit lead. Um, typical. Caught it on the little six-foot travel rod. I forgot my fourth rod. Um, been away for four days doing a trade show. Uh, everything just wet in the van and uh, forgot my fourth rod. So had a right result. Um, did predict that I'd catch one on this uh, on the hermit lead, and uh, and I have done. So uh, we'll uh, we'll just get her out the sack. She's only been in the sack for about two hours. Uh, just before first light. Um, absolute corker of a common. Uh, we'll get her out now, see how we go. The end product of a successful night. I think I'd rather have one of these than, uh, than a couple of thirties. It's a personal best common from me, for me, should I say. Caught on the XLR8, new bait from Richworth. And as predicted on the Hermit lead, I thought it wouldn't let me down. Um, they've been a bit finicky, the fish. I did hook one the first night on a sort of the basic complicated rig and the hook pulled. There's, I've had fish down here, quite a few fish, and uh, I thought I might have to get something out a bit more riggy. And this is the end product. Absolute cracker. 51 pound common. Caught on a little tiny uh, 
four inch braid that we showed you yesterday, the new braid from Ultima, four inch braided rig. You wouldn't think it would catch a fish of this size, but uh, it has, I'm one happy little rabbit. Oh. Just going to show you the other side of this magnificent creature. An old, old warrior of Etang de Pierre, no doubt. Absolutely, <laughs> oh, really thick. You can see by the uh, size of it, it's probably as wide as my, my head. Absolute stunning creature. <sighs> well pleased. It's getting a bit heavy. She's, uh, she's been out of the water a few minutes now, so I'm not wanting to keep them out too long, so we'll get her back. Really, really pleased. Right, Perry, I see you've got the old Power Plus on there, mate. Is that something you use a lot? It is, Joe. For, well, for most of me fishing, anyway. Um, I mean, the Power Carp is, is an excellent line. Uh, and I, I use that mainly for like little short-range stuff it's because it's very, very heavy. But if you was looking for, for... If you had to have one line that could do everything, then this is the one. It's got a silicon coating on it, um, which is for, for the abrasion resistance, but we actually found out or realised that it was made it smoother for your casting as well so if you're looking for a bit of distance casting i'm probably fishing at about 100 120 here and uh there's no problem with like very 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 smooth through the through the rings um it's also slow slow sinking but heavy enough you know you, you haven't got to use a back lead it's gonna as long as you're slacking off and you leave it for a while before you put your bobbins on you know you, you know you're gonna get a nice line lay okay i see you've got a very nice line lay there actually haven't you? oh i mean it goes superbly on the uh, on the reels it probably Probably the best line I've ever seen laying on a reel, to be honest. <laughs> and I'm not the best for putting it on the reel, but uh, it, this always makes me look good. Excellent, no, it does look smart. Now, Perry, what, what, what kind of fish is this, you, think, well, you reckon? I'm being told it's a, a silver carp. Uh, it was a hard fight, eh? Oh, unbelievable, I've never had a fight like that. No. It, was a, it was a very weird fight to, yeah. to a normal, you know, normal carp, if you say, like the king carp for I was standing next to you, I said, what's this? You were shouting, bird, bird, come yeah. on, I'm help me. Such a heavy, heavy fight. Oh, this is not normal. <laughs> that's, that's why you need a big mat like that. Yeah. God, look at this. It doesn't even fit in the mat. Yeah. Unbelievable fish. It's great. It's great. We're going to do it here in, yeah? Yeah, we'll uh, zero them scales. Yeah. Stay for 34 kilo. Near, that's what, nearly 70 eight. Dutch pounds. <laughs> Shall we put oh, it back sure. on the tripod? <laughs> 82 oh, pounds. Thank God for the power carp. Ah. Power plus. Power plus, I believe. Sorry. Yeah. This is one big mother. <laughs> oh. This is teamwork, I tell you, because we wouldn't have got this in otherwise. Teamwork. Ultimate. Yeah, on, ultimate yeah. team. You are one monster. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that fish. Look at that fish. Okay, right, we're just going to run through um, a few of the extra bits that, that Richworth produce. Um, obviously, to complement the boilie range, they do the flavours, the additives, pop-up mix. We're going to run through, taking it a little stage further, just making your own pop-ups. It's a, it's a forgotten art. Um, I don't know, you're a little bit younger than me, Joe. Um, have, have you ever rolled much bait? I've had little goes at it, but not a lot, and I'll be honest with you. Right. I'm I mean, too lazy. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's... I'd, I'd still like to do it, and that's why I got involved in rolling the XLR8. Um, I mean, we're going to show you um, how to do just a basic sort of a, a, a winterised um, pop-up. You know, just, just literally using the pop-up mix, an egg, flavour, and a couple of additives. Uh, I'm going to mix it up and do two flavours, just to get, make it unique. Um, I know they go well, banana zip and, and cranberry. It's one I've done quite well on in the winter. OK, just going to show how easy it is to make, you know, a unique pop-up. 
to your own sort of individual tastes. Um, basically, crack your egg in. I'm going to use two flavours. I'm going to use the cranberry. This is one that's done, you know, I've done very well. Two and a half mil of cranberry, which is quite a lot to one egg. It's, uh, that's really boosting it. And the other one from their uh, gold top range is banana zip. It's got a unique flavour. It smells like the old toffos, the old sweets. Mmm. <clears throat> so that's, that's the two flavours I'm going to use. I'm going to use a little bit of betaine. Um, it's just, you know, carp-like aminos and enzymes are always looking for that. Just get, adds a little bit more to the profile of the bait, um, especially on a single, you know, on a single pop-up. They'll detect, you know, they'll detect betaine in a single pop-up. So we're just mixing it together. Make sure you're mixing the, the flavours thoroughly. And that's enough. You know, we're only doing the one-egg mix. So and then you just add in your, add in your pop-up mix. Do this sort of carefully, a bit at a time. And uh, we're not going to we're not going to put any uh, just for sake of you know how quick we need to be. We're not going to put any egg album in. Just get a no nice whisk going, just so you get all the all the powders in. You can see how smooth and creamy that's going. <clears throat> so and you can just add a bit at a time. If you put too much in, you'll find that you'll um you'll end up with it really the, the dough really stiff, and it's it's not very workable. So you just keep working it in. Got a nice whisky motion there. Bit of a Jamie Oliver on the side. Oh yeah. Or Delia Smith. <laughs> yeah, Delia Smith for the Cartwell. So now, now it's of a consistency where we can literally pick it up. If it's too sticky, just sprinkle a little, a little, little tiny bit on there, just so, just so you can work it into the mix. But you can see from one egg. You can make a, a winter's a worth lot, a winter's worth of pop-ups. This is a gardener bait gun. So literally compress it down and then it will start coming out as a sausage. And all you're doing, literally, is rolling the sausage across the across the table. I tend to do them one at a time, um, one sausage at a time. You can do if you get good at it, you can do more and more. And all we're all we're doing rolling out the pop-ups, put them straight into the into your um, pan of boiling water, it's important it's boiling, leave it for about about a minute, let them harden off for about two days, uh, and that perfect pop-ups every time. I can't believe how quickly you've just done that. Whenever I've done my own, I've sat there rolling by hand, and they've turned out looking like I've rolled them yeah, with my feet. I mean, I could get them rounder than that. Um, that's the first one, but that's how quick, we're trying to be quick, obviously, for the camera. But you can see how easy it is to make, that can make the difference. You could fish a single look bait in the winter on an individual, you know, high flavoured pop up of your own choice. And it gives you great satisfaction to catch a fish on your own concoction. On your own concoction, you know. Um, you know, so I've always been into this side of it, the bait side. But yeah, that's how easy it is. Um, you know, it's worth a go and it's very inexpensive to make. Well, you can see we've hardly used any, any powder. You could, you know, that'll last you a couple of years, that powder, as long as you keep it airtight. As good as that, you can make it, you can either buy the shop bots or make your own, uh, and you'll catch a lot of carp on them. So what I've got here is a new product from Ultima. It's our first venture into a material that's not line. This is a lead core. Uh, we've been long and hard looking into this and a lot of development to find such a thin diameter and smooth product. Have a little feel of that. That is fine, isn't it? Yeah. It's a nice tight weave as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's taken quite a lot of research because there's an awful lot of same old, same old with lead core out there at the moment and we've tried to find something that's fine diameter so you've got no problems with ejecting leads 
beads over knots and splicing, stuff like that, so that it's as safe a product as it can be. Um, and also the camo pattern. It looks a little bit light when you see it in bright sunlight like this, but as soon as it gets immersed in water, it goes nice and dark, beds into the lake bed lovely, and we're really, really pleased with it. And as our first non-mono product, the first of many, this is going to be a good one for us. It may sound like a bit of an odd point, but I've just pulled a bit of the lead out there, and it is, it's really tough, but it's actually hard to break off. I find a lot of them are quite weak, aren't they? Sometimes they end up sticking out the sides and where they're broken, you know? Absolutely. You can't, have, you can't really have that in an ideal situation because it, it, it's not what you want the lead core to do. You want it to pin your rig to the bottom and be an excellent leader in a snaggy sort of situation. Before the fine diameter, because some people might be sort of put off by that, when they see a, a, a thick diameter a lead core product in the shots, they think, well, I could splice that e easy because it's thick. With more finer diameter lead cores, they might think, I can't get my needle through it, so I won't buy it, I'll just buy the thick ones or ready-made packs. Take out the lead, the lead like that. Like you say, it's hard to break. Quite a few Normally turns, just go it out just out goes out and it, it goes. Yeah, it doesn't. It's quite good like that. Just pop it back, insert the needle. I mean, I've never used a, a leader material that's, that's so easy to splice as this. Out the other side, pick up the end, pop it back, And pull it through and it's literally as easy as that. I can see that that's a lot easier because when I do it, when I've done it in the past with other materials, I'm having to get the needle right at the end of that because On the otherwise fine fibers, it's doubled up too much. It yeah. won't pull through it or you, pull through. you break your splicing needle. Yeah. It's that sort of finer detail that we've tried to get in the products and that's everything that Ultima try to do. We, we, we try to make something that, that's easier for the angler, good for the fish and gives you the, the ultimate presentation. Now, I've shown this product to quite a few people that have never spliced their own lead core. All they've ever done is bought lead core. And because this is so easy to do, people are buying it and, and, and using it because they can make their own. You know, they're buying a spool, they get loads of leaders out of it, and it's a really good product. So we're, there we are, Joe. It's uh, the first of many new products that we're going to bring out, and uh, I'm confident this one's going to be a big success. This is the Wivy Pool Rig. This is probably uh, what made me as, uh, as synonymous in carp angling as, as I am. Um, come up with this rig. Well, I mean, I initially was using the, uh, the bent hook rig back in the late 80s, uh, probably 87. It was Mr. Pete Wilson of Ultima who actually showed me the bent hook rig. It was when I was about 17. Uh, started using it, catching a lot of fish. It did a lot of fish damage. As a syndicate, we voted it out. It, it just wasn't a... a a considerate carp rig. We, it caught a lot of fish, but it was damaging fish. So uh, for two years, there's a bit of a lull in Wivy uh, because it was, you know, it was such a devastating rig. I started messing around, and I've always been into rigs, messing around with different variants. Initially, I came up with uh, the ring slid all the way around there. We didn't have shrink tube in those days, and I was literally fixing up a float stop and doing a round circle of, of soft tubing, and it was sliding up around there. It was catching, but it was catching in various places, and I had a couple that were outside the mouth. So something had to be, you know, it had to be changed. I knew it was on the same principle as the bent hook, and it was obviously, you can see that, it's a nice bend in the hook. This is where people get confused with the wivy. It bends out straight. So it's, you know, once it's hooked, it's done its job. If you, you know, playing a fish and it gets in the, in the weed, that, just because of the shape of the, the tubing, it actually grips the bottom lip. So if you do slacken off to it, whatever, it, it, it's one of those rigs that tends to stay in the fish's mouth more than just a hook on its own. Um, it's great for European angling, absolutely pucker for, you know, for, for all you guys fishing these, these big pits with the, with the big fish, because it creates a big hook. Um, you can close that up a little bit. I've seen, I've seen people use longer lengths of tubing and, and make them flatter so it lays, it lays along the bottom and literally just, you know, they're using it with a stiff rig. Um, so it's still, it's still the Wivy Pool rig, um, uh, but in a different form, just a lot more tubing and a lot flatter along the bottom. But this is how I use it. I always use it with a, uh, a pop-up primarily. You know, 1988 uh, was when it was conceived and, and you know, I suppose... I've got to be quite flattered that it's still used today as one of the most well-known pop-up rigs. I'm using it with the, uh, the, the, the braid from Ultima. Um, that's how I'd always use it, normally with a braid. You can use it, 
you know, like with the, uh, the, the, the fluorocarbon, you can have a, a, a semi-stiff rig, but just whip on the braid onto that. But I tend to use it braid only. I always use it at seven inches. That's the best. I did a lot of testing in the late 80s, early 90s, and I found that, that seven inches was the ultimate, you know, for fishing for fish for 25 plus to 30, that seemed to be the ultimate flip and turn, a little bit of movement on it. Um, and I was using it with a helicopter rig. And as I say, using it with the Ultima braid, and I will show you just quickly how we tie this. A lot of people are confused with how this rig, they look at it and they think, oh God, it's too confusing. Obviously, you've seen how to tie on a four turn, five turn grid or not. Literally, I'm just using it straight onto the hook. I'm using the, the GLT hooks, the penetrators, because that was one of the original hooks. It was out in those days that I used with this rig. Literally, thread on one inch of the tubing slide it down and put probably five mil over the eye of the hook. And it secures on there nice and tight. What I find with some of the stiffer shrink tubes is that once you've put this on the wivy rig, it moves about even after you've steamed it. This stuff is quite tight and it shrinks to half the size. So literally that's the start of the wivy rig. And the next thing I do is the steaming, and this is probably the, the bit that most people get wrong. Um, whilst we're doing, whilst we're waiting for the kettle to boil, I'll move on, and it's quite important, it's vital that you use it with an oval ring. Because of the way the bait sits, if you use a round ring and you tie it on, the bait, it makes the hook sit at a slight angle. It, it's not what you want, you want it to, I'll show you in a sec how you want the hook to sit. We're just using a little tiny float stop, or whatever stop you can get your hands on, but sometimes, you know, it's, it pays to, to glue this round. A lot of people fish it up near the top. I've never found it works better just on the edge of the bend. As, the, as it starts to bend, you've got an element of travel. You don't want it too far up, because what I've found is, depending on what hook you use, and if you hook the fish and your float stops up there, the hook won't penetrate into the mouth, so you're playing the whole fish, you're playing on the bend of the hook, and I've had them snap where that has slid round, so that is a key element to, uh, to, to, how it, um, to how the rig works. You need it further around there, and as you can see from that particular setup, you can see where it is. The hook then can drop. It's just, it's just perfect, and, and if I can show you that way, the way the hook sits, this is in conjunction with using it with an oval ring. I slide the knot over, slightly over to one side, and that makes the, 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 the ring sit perpendicular to the hook, and that's quite critical. It's very, well, it's very critical because with a, with a round ring, it sits like that. It's not a good presentation. That's, that's exactly how you want to tie it, just sliding the knot over. It's literally, you've got your power braid straight to the hook, one inch of tubing, a ring and a stop. It's very, very simple. Always when you're putting over steam, especially young, young kids, if, you, you know, if you're going to be steaming up links like this, always try and use some pliers. Don't put your hands anywhere near the steam. So what we'll do, just hold it straight, heat up the shrink tube and literally just bend it round till I know that's, that's the angle that I want. It's literally just a nice, a nice curved seat and that is the wivy rig. All you've got to do, tie your pop-up on, put your split shot on to balance it. I tend to use it as a critically balanced bait. You can use it as a bottom bait, it still works. A lot of people have asked me that and I, you know, when it, when, when it got hard at wivy after they'd been caning for about four years, started using it with a bottom bait and it caught me as many fish. Um, so that's, that's it, that's the Wivy Pool Rig. Um, and as I say, whether it's in England, whether it's abroad, carp are doing you all the time, and they are, no question about it. Um, you know, like I say, going back to that hermit lead, it outfished this rig at once, but there's not many other rigs that I know that this will get outfished on. This is the one. Um, if you're fishing a pop-up rig, it's probably the ultimate. Um, so, you know, that, that's as far as the Wivy Pool rig goes. Um, that's how I use it, that's how it was concepted in 1988, and it's still going to this day as one of the world's most famous pop-up rigs. Um, try it, you'll, you'll, you'll find it's good. Power car performing well. I'm in good contact with the fish. It's very important because if you want to control where the fish is going, you need as little stretch as possible. Okay. 
OK, right, well, the clever chaps at Ultima have produced, as far as I'm, I, I know, uh, the first zig of floater fishing line, designated floater fishing line, uh, on the market. This stuff's very, very unique. It has a hollow core, so it will always float. When you're floater fishing, absolutely imperative that you don't have a sinking link. Um, and this stuff will catch an awful lot of fish all the way over the world. Very, very unique product. I'll show you very, very quickly. It's again, you've seen the basic complicated rig. Literally, you're tying on a little loop onto the end of the, the power zig. Trim off your tag end. I'll show you with one piece of corn just to make it quick. All we're doing, lassoing the bait on, as you can see from the two colours. I quite like using two colours. It just it's something different. Most people will probably use, you know, one one colour. You could even put the, the corn on the other way, and that's probably how I would normally fish it. You take off your required length for your power zig, using a very small outturned eye hook. In this case, it's a size eight. Through the back of the eye. Take the power zig and then pull it down towards your designated hook bait, whatever it will be. Have quite a short hair. Makes it a little bit tricky in tying, once you've got the hang of it, tying the actual basic complicated. But I'll go four turns on a zig and then underneath four turns. This one's even closer and this is probably how I would fish it rather than the longer hair. It's all fingers and thumbs when you're doing zig rig, but that is zig rig fishing. But there are days when it's the only method, and it's uh, it's caught some of the largest carp in the uh, in in the country in England at least. That's probably how I would fish it, very close to to the uh, the hook bait like that. Just literally, carp takes hold of it, it's hooked, and that is the power zig line. Very very unique product. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, stays floating. It'll keep your hook bait floated. It'll catch you a lot of fish. Absolutely blinding product. like a weightlifting session, guys. This is the power shock leader. When you fish snaggy conditions, like over bars or in snags, you really want a abrasion resistant line. These are scissors that show you that they are sharp. Now, I will demonstrate to you, if it actually goes in action, yeah, I'll make sure it's nice and tight. It's amazing, it's yeah, mind blowing. If, if, if this line rubs against a bar or like muscles or stuff like that, it just takes forever and ever and ever to snap. And you will land your fish in the most difficult conditions. I used it a lot of times at Rainbow Lake and it brought me all those big fish out of there. It's a fantastic line. It's fluorocarbon coated, so it's less visible than any other shock leader and it's still nice and supple. This is the ultimate shock leader for the toughest conditions. OK, well, I'm just going to run through my marker float setup and how to actually set a marker float up. I'm using, uh, as you can see from the reel, uh, a green floating braid. It's a new braid from Ultima. It's a, it's a nice profile for, for winding onto the reel. Basically, I always use a 50-pound leader. So 
whipped onto the braid, the, th the thinner braid, is this thicker leader, just so you know, I don't, I don't um, cut into my fingers when I'm casting it. A lot of people use a finger stool, I don't tend to use it, that's why I use the thicker leader. Basically what you're doing is putting on a ring swivel. You can get larger swivels, and uh, larger rings than that to go onto the, uh, onto the line, but I tend to use a ring swivel. If, it's, if that gets clogged up, it's not where I tend to want to fish. Basically I'm using a probably a 12 inch length of the, the 50 pound leader again, just in case there is a little bit of bottom debris. I don't want to get hooked up round, you know, round the swivel so the, the float won't come up. And that is basically f threaded up the line. A lot of people use a, a round dumpy type um, lead. I tend, I tend not to use that. If I'm going across an area that's, that's silty, weedy, uh, I want to be able to pull through it. And this tends to, a, a zip lead tends to pull through it. I can still feel what, through the braid what I'm fishing over. I tend primarily to fish over silt. So this is perfect for, for a silt. You know, if I was fishing gravel, I might use a dumpier lead. So that's basically threaded up the line and you're literally straight through to a bead, which is quite important because um, the, the, the loop of the, uh, the ring swivel can get caught over the, over the swivel of the marker float. As that bangs, that stops that, that bead stops the, uh, the swivel getting caught up. So basically what you're doing, primarily, you're gonna pull along the bottom, fill the area you want to if you're on a nice smooth silt bed, which I found out there, um, and then you let the line out, stage at a time, and if you've got a marker on the rod, I use the spod rod, the Shimano spod rod, the Beastmaster, for all spodding and marker float. So I've notched in a 12 inch mark. So what I literally do is let off the, the line. Once the marker float pops up, you know how deep what you're fishing over. Um, and that's basically the marker float setup. So um, I'll run you through the spod, which is very, very similar. The, sp the spod setup I use. Exactly the same rod, exactly the same braid, the new braid from Ultima, the 50 pound shock leader, and literally one of the cordless spods. Um, I use an awful lot of hemp in my, uh, in my spodding, so that hence that's why you're seeing the tape there. I take off the fins if you're using the older type, just so it travels more true, leave the top fins alone, and I literally just taping up three quarters of the way up the spod, and that just stops all the hemp falling out the holes and you're getting spillage. You don't want spillage over your, over your line and get false line bites. And it's just, you know, it's still, it's still very easy to pull across the top, especially if you make a little hole in the bottom, as I've done there. And that's basically, that's the basic setup. Very, very easy. Just tie, tie the 50 pound leader onto the end of the quarter spod and you're ready to go. Okay, we're gonna have a quick brief look at what we're putting into the, uh, the spod mix. The base of it, as always, with all my spod mix is salami's hemp. That's basically a garlicky hemp with a little hint of salami in it. Party blend and peanut. Peanut is absolutely blinding. It is, it's, it's a known one from the 80s right the way through. It's cooked properly. I know it's cooked properly. Hinders have cooked it properly. Basically, we're using salami's pellets. That's what's giving it the stodginess. Um, so, it, you know, in, in the top of the top of the spod, I can push it down. I don't need to worry about it come, flying out the top of the spod. If I was just using hemp on its own, rich with halibut powder, I mix that up with a little bit of lake water, and that makes the, the stodge for me, just to, uh, just to keep all the hemp in so it doesn't fly all you know, in between you and the marker, so you end up getting loads of liners. And the only, only other key in, ingredient that I've put in is a couple of handfuls of protein powder. This is what the bodybuilders use. It's very high protein powder, it's 80% protein. Carp love high, high proteins, and this really clouds, clouds the spot up as it's going through the water. And uh, I've seen, as soon as I've put this out on quite a few different waters, I've seen the carp um, literally rolling straight over the spod mix and they're following the spod mix down. They're following the, I I even if it's windy, you can see them rolling f over the white protein powder. So I know it's a good one. I know they like it. Big carp love protein. And that is basically the spod mix. It's, it's not too in-depth. It's an easy one. It's ready, ready, ready to go. All you've got to do is mix it up and uh, you'll be catching lots of carp for your, uh, for your album. OK, well, basically, I've had a few casts around. Um, I've had a good mark float around. I know what I'm looking for. There's a lovely sort of smooth area out there. It's not that far out, probably only 40, 45 yards out. So we're just gonna put the rod out there. Um, I'll show you what we do once we found the spot. I know it's gonna, it's gonna come across, it's a very sm sort of hard area. I think it's hard, hard silt or clay. It's a soft bottom, but this is quite a hard bottom. So it's obviously a good feeding spot that, you know, could be a natural larder for the carp. So what I'm gonna do is basically put the rod back on it um, and then we'll just show you how to, uh, how to work out the depth of the area that you're in. 
So we just cast it out now. And that's it, that's bump. I felt that down. Um, that felt absolutely... So basically you hold your rod, just pull it very gently till you can feel the float back to the lead. And hold, hold the rod now, the, the tip, in the same position. Don't make the mistake of sort of moving the rod as you're doing it. It's got to be held in that same position, so I know it's, you know, it's, pretty, it's dead straight out from me. Right, now we're in position. I've shown you where my one-foot marker is. So we're just going to pull, pull the float down to the lead. I felt that bounce, and now we're going to start letting the line out, just to see how deep it is. So we've got one foot, two foot, three foot, four foot. We're not forgetting that the, uh, that the tail is about a foot long. That's five foot six foot and we should just about be coming up on about eight or nine eight there you go eight foot that's exactly on the spot exactly on the spot so i've let out eight it's come up it's about seven seven and a seven and a half foot absolutely perfect we're, we're bang on it and what we're going to do now because I've fished the spot already, I'm actually clipped up to it. Um, but it's always, it's always a good idea, especially with the corner spots, they're quite heavy, is to actually cast the spot to the float before you start putting any ground bait out. Because one spot of, of hemp, you know, a, a spot full of hemp, can keep a carp away from your hook bait for a very long time. So we're just going to test the distance and cast. There we go, clipped up. And that's absolutely spot on. That's when you wish that you had a, a, a bait fall because that's gone absolutely bang on. So we know we're clipped up now and we're ready to put out our spod mix. I mean, depending on where you're fishing, how many fish you're fishing for, you know, how busy the water is, do you want to control an area of a lake on how many spods you put out? Generally, if I'm using hemp per rod, I would put out probably 10 spods when I start. Carp love hemp, they love boilies. So what we do, it's important when you're filling these spots, don't overfill them and don't press them down. If you've got a stodgy mix like this, don't press them down too hard. Literally, just enough on there, just to tap it. But now we're, we're ready to go, bang. And we've hit, it's hit the clip. As you can see, it's right on the money. It pays to do a smallish a smallish area I normally do about six spots in a small area and then put one or two either side of the spot mix in case when you're casting out in the middle of the night there's spot off of the main area and I tend to fish the main rods off of the spotted area anyway so we just retrieve that in and as you can see the taped up spot still comes in as, as well as ones with holes in you know um, with no tape on it <clears throat> so we're ready to go next one filling it up again Three quarters full, it's pretty vital. And as I say, just, just literally finger push it down, not hard, and that's enough to stop the spod spill. And we'll put this one out, hopefully, back on the same spot. And that's perfect. And that's literally how to spot and mark. If you don't get it accurately, you could end up with a very frustrating fishing session because you could have bits and bobs all over your swim keeping the carp away from your hook bait because they do love the small bits and pieces and what you need to be is very accurate and one point that's very vital in spotting and marking is use the horizon markers so close your eyes look at the trees where they are and you think right i'll use that dip there and that's the position that i'm going to cast to you can even if you get good at it you can even cast at night um i could i could do this where this is clipped up i could put this out at night if i have a fish i'll put a couple of spots falls back on the spot and i know it'll be dead accurate and that is a way forward in, in carp angling. Carp love spod, springtime, summertime, autumn and winter. I use, I use hemp in winter, mainly hemp. I don't tend to use anything fish mealy or anything like that, but mainly hemp and they still love it. And that's enough to get them going. Like, you know, fishing a single hook bait over a couple of spots of hemp has always worked for me in the winter. So hope that helps.
Right then, Stephen, got the ultimate power here. What's the concept behind this line, mate? Uh, main concept behind this is a, ca a casting line. It's got a good diameter, it's super supple, and it just sort of peels off the spool of dream. I first took it out to America with me on holiday, and uh, I fished a great big reservoir, 120,000 acres. And, um, yeah, you're sort of casting at the horizon, really. You're just trying to launch your leads, because we didn't have no boats or anything like that. And um, I really was impressed with this. So much so that I've sort of got a couple of spools in my kit and um, if there's ever a situation where I just need to sort of, you know, cast as far as possible, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll spool up with this stuff. Super. I've got to admit, it does feel really nice and soft. I can imagine that just peeling off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can use it in all sorts of situations, you know, fast-flowing rivers and, and lay a nice slack line into it and it sort of cuts through the flow of a tree. It really does. It's pretty tough as well. It's not, yeah. not the easiest line to bite through. No. I, well, most of the Ultima products are, you know, really high in abrasion and, you know, they're really robust. So, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be on board and... Um, to be using some of their kit. Top stuff. Well, this is one that's close to my heart, Steve. <laughs> It certainly is, Joe. I've seen you uh, on cart TV using this. Yeah, I mean, we first started using it around our way um, when I used to work in a tackle shop donkeys years ago. And um, well, it's one of my mates that first started using it, and particularly the, the fishing squid one. Um, yeah. They're powdered paste, aren't they? They're active extracts. They're an active powder um, that literally you're fishing as a paste, but you can roll it into any shape you want. Triangles, squares, um, w whatever shape you want, whether it'll be a boilie. I mean, we've got some here that I've rolled up I mean, that's, yeah, they've gone rock hard. Rock hard, yeah. I was saying, yeah. saying to you earlier, wasn't I? I mean, I've never really done it like this before. All we used to do is literally wrap a layer around a boilie yeah. and a little stringer and uh, over layer pits. It would be the difference of, you know, loads of bites or nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. In yes. fact, we actually, it was one of the things that we actually ended up calling it Blank Buster. It was like, even in doubt, get the paste out. Fantastic products. They do all the flavours. Um, they do spice meat, fish and squid. One of my favourites, uh, this one here, is the blue cheese and garlic. Right. Um, I know you use the fish yeah, and squid. Me, the this is supposed to be the one. They all rave about it, all the old boys that have been on this sort of, uh, on this, this method. You can do it as a boilie, um, you can do it as a square, a, a, you know, whatever you want, dumbbell, um, and fish it, and it will last. They do two, two varieties. They do one five hour, which starts, will be totally broken down in five hours and gone. This one, I, I use the 15 hour one. Um, because I'm, you know, I'm always doing nights or whatever, you know. So if I'm using it, it would be the 15-hour one. But then I'd take it a step further and harden them off. So I'm actually using them after after an hour in the water. They start, they leave a film over it. I mean, the carp just must find it so, you know, it's it's just unusual. Um, and, and the actual inner sort of firms up in the water as well, yeah. doesn't it? The yeah, outer, it does. like you say, you get like that weird snotty film around. Yeah, the edge you, of it. you squeeze it, and you, like you say, the, the inner's harder, and and, and uh, you know, and you've got that that film round it. And I think they find it very attractive. It's unusual; they don't come across it much. Um, you can see but, why it's kicking off. It's constantly kicking off flavours, isn't it? You yeah. Know, if, and if you're fishing in silt or anywhere like that where your baits are normally sort of sucking in it, yeah. uh, the sort of debris and the smell, yeah. it's the other way around, isn't it? It's yeah. constantly emitting that scent. Well, well, you can also you can you can make them to your own, your own to your own advantage. Uh, you can make whatever combination you want. I mean, you can use. I know you use lake water, which is ideal. <laughs> the carp are swimming in lake water, their lake water. But I tend to sort of mix it up with, you know, like um, Minamino or, or the Rich Amino. I think another thing worth mentioning, I mean, they're, they're, they look like quite small tubs, don't they? But it's surprising how far one of these goes, isn't oh, it? Oh, you could literally, yeah. I mean, you know, if you, um, if you were to roll up that whole tub, you'd get an amazing amount. You'd probably last you, that could last you six months worth of angling, more than that, if you're putting a two-bait stringer out. Um, I mean, I was going to roll it, but it's as simple as 
adding in a flavour, adding in the bulk liquid, adding in lake water, rolling it in, make it into a paste, make it any shape you want. They harden off within 24 hours. That's about all you can say on it, but like I say, one little tub will last you a good season's fishing um, if, you're, if you're using them sensibly. Uh, it's, it's the wonder product that doesn't get any mentions um, because it's, I don't, I don't know why, but <laughs> if you're struggling, um, try it, especially in the winter. Definitely, seriously underrated that. Yeah, definitely. Right, this one's for the tackle tarts amongst you. Most of the consultants here at Ultima use these new ATT alarms and um, yeah, nice, neat, compact little item. Really done the business for us. Yeah, as you can see, where they're small, they haven't got actual speaker in them, but that is in the, re in the receiver part of it. The receiver part of it also vibrates, which I will show you. So, yeah, you've got the option of having the tail on or off, so when you've got that complete on silent, it will only vibrate. Next to that, the actual head is 100% waterproof, as Steve will demonstrate in a minute. Yep. They've actually had these on uh, underwater for something like 18 months, which is absolutely phenomenal. But yeah, here we go. Next to uh, being waterproof, you can also change the sensitivity on them. You can put in different rollers, uh, they come in different colours to match your hangers, or they come in nice bright white, or just an, uh, a plain black. Now they've also got um, super battery life, and uh, the actual cover of the um, the alarm deactivates the, uh, the the head, the battery. Yeah. Yeah, it deactivates the head by a little magnet strip that's in it. Really handy. So there's no there's no buttons. There's nothing actually on the buzzer itself. Yeah, that can make it go wrong. Uh, if, Right. The only moving part is a little wheel, yeah, and nothing can break. Ah, oh, they're what? nice, neat, compact. They're forward thinkers, and um, they've used the most of the technology available by bringing out this anti-theft system for your car. Yeah, the system communicates with the receiver that you use for your normal alarms. When you park your car in the car park at the lake, the, the system will tell you if someone will try to break into your car, which will give you a nice peace of mind when you're fishing. Yeah, it also gives you um, a little bit of time to leg round and sort of say you're scaring. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and when you're going like, to the lake, you've got all your kit set in your car and you've just got to shoot down the calf to get... Shopping. Yeah, shopping. Uh, Take your permit. They've also made this, this little mini receiver which you can stick in your pocket and which will do exactly the same thing as the big receiver, so the system is actually multifunctional, uh, multifunctional yeah, and, you, and you can use it when you're not fishing as well. If you're looking for your next set of alarms, replacing your old ones, next time you're in a tackle shop, definitely have a look at this range of products from ATT. Yeah, they do the business and they come highly recommended from the boys at Ultima. Etang de Pierre is a venue that's available to book exclusively through Dream Fishing Holidays. Whether booking for yourself or for a group of up to ten anglers, this superb lake offers some truly awesome fishing. Tactically, it's not too difficult, and there are 30 or so swims to choose from, offering a range of features at varying distances. Set in stunning surroundings, Pierre is not far from all the local amenities, including restaurants, patisseries and supermarkets. This particular venue has established itself as an outstanding water, with a host of quality anglers fishing its banks throughout the year, with many regularly reporting personal best captures. With an excellent purpose-built shower and toilet block on site, Pierre is the perfect drive and survive carp fishing holiday, with many people returning year after year. However, to save disappointment, it's recommended that you book early. Dream Fishing Holidays have many venues throughout France and are widely regarded as one of the top fishing holiday companies. Each and every one of their venues caters specifically for carp anglers looking for not only some high quality fishing but also for a true holiday experience. Some of their venues are drive and survive 
whilst others can provide real home-from-home -home luxury on the bank. So if you're looking to venture into France for your next fishing trip, Dream Fishing Holidays have everything you could want and more. Take a look at their website for full details of all their venues, up-to-date prices and lots more information. We hope that this film has given you a feel for the time and dedication that Ultimate put into developing and testing their lines. We also hope that it's given you some useful tips on rigs and other aspects of carp fishing that will be of benefit to you in the future. More in-depth information is available on all aspects of line and line care on Ultima's comprehensive website, where you'll also find full details of your nearest Ultima dealer and also details of new products that are due to be launched. You will have noticed that throughout the film, the guys have been wearing some of the items of clothing from Ultima's great new range of carp team gear. These high quality items are now available for everyone to purchase directly from the website. The Ultima team had enjoyed a superb few days at Itang de Pierre. They'd caught carp, but more importantly they'd used the time to work on developing new product for the company. One thing's for sure, Ultima makes some superb product and every one of the team has their own particular favourite. I'll, I'll take the carp fishing quite seriously uh, and moved consultancy positions purely for power carp. Um, it's what I'm looking for in a product. The line, it sinks. It's, it's see-through and it's got an amazing strength, not strength. Um, that is probably, there's, there's quite a few products in the range that have really sort of attracted me, but that was the one to, you know, it takes a lot for me to move companies. Um, so Power Carp has got to be the one. Well, my favourite ultimate product must be the, the snag leader. I mean, it's got me out uh, so many nasty situations with, like, with the obstacles here in France, like with the uh, sawing down the trees and everything, the tree stumps. And it just, it can take such a beating. I've landed so many fish because of it. It's just, I love it. Uh, my favourite ultimate product is Power Carp because of its reliability. Um, you need a main line that you're totally sure of and Power Carp provides that uh, function to me. Um, since I've been using it for about 18 months now, I wouldn't change to anything else. Um, I'm using the Power Zig now because uh, I like Zig rigs. Uh, we have a lot of lakes where, which have very clear water, so it's a, it's a good product to use uh, for, zig, uh, for zig rigs, and I catch a lot on, uh, on them. The product I use most is the Ultima Shack Leader. Uh, I use it because it's sinking very fast, it's nearly invisible in the water, and I, I'm catching very well with it, so it's a good product. I like the Ultima Power Carp line, it really sinks well, the bracing is good. It's really a tough line and uh, it suits my fishing. And also the snag leader, I used a 30 pound snag leader. It brought me a lot of fish at Rainbow between the snags. It's one of the best snag leaders I've ever had my hands on. Uh, the product I use the most with Ultima at the moment is the Power Link. Um, just simply because of the, it's almost invisible in water and I'm, I'm after big fish. And uh, the, the best camouflage I can get is what I need. The Altman product I use the most and, and am most excited about at the moment is a, a new product that we're bringing out called Pure Power. It's our first venture into a pure fluorocarbon mainline and it's been in the pipeline for a long while. It's had an awful lot of testing and I'm very excited about it. It's, it's, it's going to be something very, very special in the pure fluorocarbon market. Some really good Ultima products out there and it is really hard to pick and choose one but uh, the one that I really like at the moment is the Power Stiff. I've um, been playing with some sort of spring rigs for pop-ups and bottom baits. It's um, got good abrasion resistance, obviously they're not strength. You know they put a lot of research and a lot of effort into their products and the development in the future is um, yeah, something that a lot of people should really keep their eye out.